All right, we're jumping uh, back into Ableton Live today. Uh, I've mentioned to most of you that there's a session on Blackboard that you need to download that we're going to be using as our demo uh, for today. Uh, it seems like there's a few configuration errors with Max for Live. Uh, when I get to that, I, there's like one plugin from Max for Live that I wanted to show you. It's not absolutely crucial. I might have to demo it up here rather than demo it at your uh, station, and uh, we'll check the configuration. It looks like the Maybe the, the basic install is installed on some sh computers, but all the other plugins that come with Max for Live are not there, so we'll need to fix that. Um, so, real quick, okay, we, we, we ended on Friday talking about Project One, yes? Yep. Okay, uh, and I'm actually going to get out my timer here because I want to get this in and like, I want to get to the demo by like 10 after, so I'm going to set a timer just so I can see how much, so I can stop myself. Seven minutes, start, okay. Um, so, quick, yes? Password for what? You, you need to turn off the Wi-Fi. None of these computers should be on Wi-Fi because they have Ethernet connections on the back. Yeah. It keeps doing this back authentication issue. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to. Let's try to push past those for now. Okay. Uh, so project one, right? Uh, we've talked about the required elements. You need a live session. You need a recording of it, either audio or video. You need to stick with the three genres that we've outlined. It's got to be at least two minutes. It's got. You also got to have a short paragraph, a la program notes. Okay. Uh, you don't have to have Max, you don't have to use the Synthi, you don't have to use the Eurorack, but you are not barred from use, using these things. It's not that you're forbidden from using these things, it's that you're not required to use these things, okay? Um, so if you want to push into these areas and use these things, that's uh, your prerogative, okay? Uh, the timeline, we've discussed the timeline on Friday, yes. Uh, the thing that I want to point out here that should be a little bit of a wake-up call, okay? This is one week from today here, okay? There's these optional meetings in my office for drafts, okay? So this is coming up uh, pretty quick. So this is, uh, if, if you haven't gotten started, you need to get started ASAP, okay? Uh, because uh, these deadlines are gonna come up on you fast and furious if you don't get started right away, okay? Make sense? Have I put enough like urgency behind this, okay? The part that I kind of stalled on last time, right, was talking about the points breakdown, okay? Literally what I'm going to do is talk about, I'm going to have a sheet of paper that has all those required elements and I'm going to rate them of saying, you know, this is above my expectations, this met my expectations, this was below expectations, or this was missing, okay? Uh, now, the required draft that's on the schedule, uh, it's kind of, Let's see, I don't want to set up a false expectation that your, your required draft has to be amazing. So I think that's the one element that does not have to exceed expectations, yes? Can we agree on that? Okay, because a draft by definition should be a work in progress. If your draft exceeds expectations, then uh, you're, you're, it's not really a draft, it's a finished product and we're, we're not having a conversation about how you develop the work, okay? Is that a fair statement? Okay. Um, so that's the one element that I'm not going to check off exceeded expectation. That, that's a, you handed it in or you didn't, okay? Um, now, the point penalties for this assignment are pretty drastic when one element is missing. My question to you guys, because I, I could go either way on this, is the required draft, should that be one of the uh, elements that if it's missing, it drops you down to the 16, 17 point range? <coughs> I could go either way on this. I think there should be some penalty for not handing in a required draft. But the question is, should it be as harsh as eight points off the, the total? I, I, and, and these points directly relate to points in your uh, final class grade, because this 25 points goes in as 25 points in your final <coughs> class grade. This is the part where I'm asking for your input. So you have to... Or is, is this it not going to be required? Or not? Is that the question? What now? Is the question is it going to be required or not? Or how much is it? Uh, I feel like it, it is required. The question is, should I make some sort of addendum that not handing in the required draft is not as bad as not handing in the paragraph or the video or the that sort of stuff, Hunter? Instead of doing eight points, just do half another grade. 
Because eight points, if this is the total for the class, then that means that he's going to be taking on more than half a letter grade. Yes. So if you do half a letter grade instead, that seems like a good compromise. So you're saying that... Because five points is half a letter grade, whereas right now it's at eight points. The question is, should some elements be worth more than other elements, basically? All right, that's, that's really the, the key question. Am I, am I, I, don't, I don't know how to judge your silence. Is it your silence that it's too early to be making question, answering questions about your final grade in the class, or is it that I'm not explaining this sufficiently? Both? Okay. <laughs> okay. The required, right now, the way it's structured, the required draft, if you don't hand it in, you drop all the way to 16 or 17 on the overall project, which means that you just lost eight points off your final grade for not handing in the required draft. So why wouldn't you hand in the required draft? It's just a draft. Yeah. So it's just a draft. It just needs to be... 16, 17. You should be penalized pretty heavily if you don't turn in a draft. Mm-hmm. AJ? I agree. I mean, like, you so it's a draft that doesn't have to be a finished project, like why wouldn't you turn at least something in? So. Okay. I would say the draft should weigh more than the um, paragraph. Okay. I mean, all of these things are easy in and of themselves. It's the total package, right, that is doing this project, yes? Okay. Uh, I just want you to be, uh, so I'm hearing some voices saying, you know what, it's just a just hand something in so that you get the points so you're not losing all those points for not handing something in. Are we okay with that? I mean, sure. Okay. If it, if, I mean, it's I I, I I I sympathize somewhat with AJ's perspective here of like it's you just need to hand something in to show that you're you're working on it at that point basically. The only thing is that I'm looking at the syllabus and I don't see it on here. Uh, well, it was recorded on Friday and it's up on YouTube, so yeah. Yeah. I can, I can turn this, and that was one of the questions I had on Friday was whether my verbal explanation over the slides on YouTube was enough or whether I needed to write this all out. And the consensus in the class was I didn't need to write it all out. I recorded class and it's on YouTube. Okay. So are we moving forward with the required draft is a required, is equal in weight to all the required elements and therefore you must hand something in on that date, okay? Okay, so I, I, that, I, I didn't want to gloss past the gravity of that, right? Okay, that's my point, that's my reason for slowing down and making sure you understand the implications of make sure you hand in that required draft, okay? Because it is equal in weight to all the required elements, okay? Uh, no, a week from this Friday. A week from this Friday, yes? Okay. Uh, any other questions about the grading scale then? Because my timer went off. Okay, so you understand that basically this is how I grade, okay? Uh, and so it's, it's not a I handed it in and everybody gets a participation 25 points basically, okay? This is going to be graded on a scale in terms of uh, the overall quality of things, okay? If you hand everything in and everything meets expectation, you should expect to get a 20 or 21 out of 25, okay? Uh, you need to exceed expectations to get up into the 24, 25 range, okay? Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot in terms of four points, but it's four points in your final average, okay? So keep it in your mind that way, okay? Um... Okay, and missing, so uh, another scenario, if you don't hand in a draft and then you don't hand in a paragraph, that's two required elements, that's a 14 or 15 out of 25, okay? So it's a pretty steep penalty. You just lost a letter grade off your final average at that point, okay? But it means that you're not doing the work that's required of the project, okay? And so I think it should be a steep penalty at that point, okay? Cool, I'm going to uh, let that be. I'm happy to answer other questions uh, about this uh, at a later time because I want to make sure I get to our demo. Uh, before we get to our demo, let's talk reading responses, okay? Um, this is where I, it was helpful to look through this. This is our second week reading from Chapter 5. So today's was kind of a summary of the entire chapter uh, reading response. Uh, there was some... Uh, uh, some uh, 
differences of opinion about the, the efficacy of the monkey effects section of the chapter, okay? Uh, and in particular, I had one person who flat out said this was not helpful at all, and another person who said this was really helpful to hear this analogy, basically. So if, if I could at this point say, Victoria and Catherine, you two should have a conversation, uh, okay, uh, about the monkey effects section of the chapter, okay, because you had like that polar opposite response and maybe just talking to each other and explaining uh, peer learning, right, can go on here in, in that case, okay. Um, I, it, it is kind of a goofy analogy to talk through these different effects that way, okay? Uh, and we're not going to be talking about every type of effect this week, so I, I don't want to get too bogged down in the monkey effects just other than connect those two individuals, okay? Uh, the other one person mentioned this. Uh, there's a few points in the chapter where he refers to a sound card rather than an audio interface. Uh, sound card may be him kind of dating himself, okay? So before audio interfaces were boxes that were external to the machine, they were cards that went in the inside the machine in your expansion slots, your PCI slots inside the card, okay? So um, when, when the audio interface is inside the machine, it's a sound card, but almost no audio interfaces are inside the machine anymore, okay? So that's, know that uh, we're talking about the same thing at that point. Make sense? So just want to make sure we're clear on that. Uh, and then why was I playing uh, Vampire Weekend at the be beginning of class? Well, I, I was kind of thinking of another, last week I used 12 Bar Blues as kind of the basis of a session to kind of build, uh, build things up. Uh, I, I was looking for another harmonic pattern that we could use that there's been uh, several pieces of pop music based on it. Pachelbel's Canon is one of them. How, have you, how many of you have seen these, there's this video out there basically where the guy kind of vamps on Pachelbel's Canon and all the pop songs that are Right. Okay. So a lot of you have seen that because it's kind of made the rounds on social media. If you haven't, Google this and you'll have that video. Not right now, but Google this later, basically, and you can watch that video to see all the pop songs that are based on Pachelbel's Canon. Okay. Uh, those that are those that have had some weeks of uh, music history. Who's Pachelbel? What is a Canon? And this is not a military device. Yes. Yeah, Christian. Mm -hmm. He's famous for his canon that uses a descending 5 6 variant. And um, that bass line is used a lot. It's uh, like, not a lot, but like it's used throughout music. Mm -hmm. Until like this very time. Yeah, it, it's, it's a descending bass line that has been used a lot in, uh, in music throughout the years. And so when I played Step by Vampire Weekend, you may have. Right, hear that bass line that's repeating, okay? It's eight pitches that per, that repeats throughout the entire song, basically, okay? It Pachelbel did that many years ago. The Baroque period is what time frame? Yeah, 16 to 1700, okay? So it, it's, it stood the test of time, yes? Okay, can we agree on that? We're, we're now in the 21st century, okay? Uh, and there's a number of songs that are based on this. I want to use this as the basis of our uh, demo today. So I'm going to go this way. No, 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 let's see here. I'm going to hide this. That's not what I want. Uh, I'm going to launch live, and you should hopefully have downloaded the session by this point. Uh, that's available on Blackboard. Okay, uh, I know there are some errors that popped up, but we're going to push through those. I'm going to open my recent set, which is the same thing that you guys have. So it, it bless you. The errors have to do with uh, Max for Live, and we'll have to look at those another time because I think Max for Live is not crucial to this uh, demo. Okay. The theme for this week, if the theme last week was filters, the theme week before that was modulation synthesis, the theme this week is going to be delays, okay, and working with delays, yes. I don't know why, I don't know why Lawrence is like, media-wise, Just hit OK and keep going, okay? Push through the errors, okay? Don't let the computer tell you what it can and cannot do. Tell you are in control of the computer. I believe in you, digital arts people, okay? You tell the computer what to do, not the other way around, okay? Okay, so um, here we are looking at this, and if you hit
play on this and then trigger this one clip right here called ground bass. You should start to hear this descending bass pattern coming out of your computer at some point. Okay, so right off the bat, what's the problem with our descending bass line and this compared to the Vampire Weekend track that we just listened to? It's fast, right? It's how fast? It's about twice as fast, yes? Okay, good. So good ear on the tempo there, okay? So I'm going to hit stop, okay? How can we get something to be slower, to slow it down, okay? Uh, what? What now? We can tap the tempo, but look, if you look at the tempo right off the bat, the tempo is 77, okay? Uh, half of 77 is like 30, what, 37, 38. That's a really, really, really slow tempo for music, okay? So rather than slow the tempo down, rather than tap the tempo and slow it down, okay, I'd rather augment the rhythm, okay, so that it is actually taking twice as long to play back, okay? Because um, this, is, this is a tool that you can use for variation in your musical composition is actually slowing down the rhythm keeping the tempo the same, okay? Because if we play it with half notes as opposed to quarter notes, we will get the same effect of having it be at that slower tempo, okay? So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to take this clip and I'm just going to option click drag and duplicate it, okay? So I just option click drag, okay? Make sure you're working on the copy, but then if you double click on it, you're going to see our rhythm down in the, cl uh, the uh, clip display the note editor, okay? Uh, and if you just simply select all so that all of our notes are selected, so I just, I clicked in the gray area and then I hit command A in order to select all of them so that they all turn blue, okay? Uh, and then over here, something that we have yet to really explore are, is the note clip, the clip, let's see, some clip controls for the notes inside the clip. Okay, uh, and I want to call your attention to two buttons that uh, look sort of like, I don't know, weird emojis, uh, weird emoticons here, right? Okay, uh, but one is a divide by two and the other one is a multiply by two, okay? These are for augmenting and diminishing the rhythm. I should have done it the other way. Augmenting and diminishing the rhythm, okay? To use proper music theory terminology here, okay? So if we take the divide by two, you'll notice that it all of a sudden compresses the rhythm and now takes half the time. So if I play it now, oh, and I trigger the right clip, okay, it's now playing twice as fast. That's not what we wanted though. We wanted to actually augment the rhythm. We want to go the other direction. That's where the multiply by two goes into effect. And if we click on that, it will slow it down. And now it takes twice as long. Okay. Notice though, when it takes twice as long, it we're now beyond the boundaries of the clip, right? Because the clip was two measures long. We need to now expand the clip. So if you click right over here, uh, this uh, selection at the top, make sure we make it four measures long. Okay. So this bar at the top actually controls the loop component of the clip so that it loops a certain component over and over again. So this loop boundary is, is clip specific and we need to make sure we take this and expand it to four bars. Now if I play it, I've got the proper timing, right, to mimic the Vampire Weekend song that I played at the beginning of class. Make sense? Is everybody able to augment the rhythm? Okay. This is a handy little tool for building variation into your musical compositions, yes? Something can be recorded, okay? Uh, it's also a handy tool if you're someone that plays better at slower rhythms than you do at faster rhythms. You can play it at half tempo and then simply, with one button, compress the rhythm and it's all of a sudden playing twice as fast, okay? Okay? So now we've got it working at half speed. Uh, I'm going to very quickly, I've got two clips here, and I, I want to make sure I can tell the difference between the two of these. So it's a good idea to go ahead and rename the second clip. I'm going to just call it ground bass times two, okay? 
so that I know it's twice as long. Okay. So we work through that. Okay. So now we've got one layer of our ground base, right? Okay. We want to make. What if we wanted to uh, thicken this up a little bit, get a little bit richer texture by actually adding other voices playing the same clip? Okay. Uh, that's where the other two tracks in this group come into play. So if you want to go ahead and uh, to follow along here, go ahead and click and drag and copy these over to the other two tracks that we have. Okay. Again, there I've put them all in a group, which we covered groups last week. So you should know what a group is. You should know what a group does, right? Um, but we've now got all three of these layers playing the same augmented rhythm. Okay, so I've copied it over to the other two tracks, and if I now click this and trigger it, okay, and just so you can hear them individually, you can use the solo button, this is the original. So we've got some clear differences, right, in terms of timbre and the envelope on these different voices, right? But using them in tandem with each other, we get a much thicker bass sound out of it, okay? So one key technique for uh, building up your production, for building up your sound palette, is to actually double um, clips and triple, sometimes triple clips, uh, so that they're playing on multiple voices, so you get new timbres that way by combining timbres playing the same thing okay um okay so next step i want to do so right now everything's panned dead center we can actually build even more variation let's go ahead and take the square rezo sweep and pan it left and take the fm short lead and pan it right So it just gets a little bit more variation coming out of the stereo spectrum, the fact that we've got these two voices kind of on either side of it, okay? So this is another technique you can use. That don't pan everything in your mix dead center, okay? Um, you want to use the stereo spectrum to your advantage. Use the fact that you have two channels of information going to two different ears to kind of build variation in your sound palette, okay? Uh, the next thing I want to do is the thing that was causing errors on some of your machines. So if you click on the square rezo track and let's, I guess double click. How many of you, do you guys see this delay notes here or does anybody? No. Okay, so it looks like Max for Live is not properly configured. Uh, we need to make sure that all the supporting... What? Awesome. So, okay, so I'll talk to IT about that, okay? What this does, okay, uh, this is one type of delay, okay? This is a delay, though, that happens at the MIDI level, okay? It's actually going to delay the start of these MIDI notes by a certain amount of milliseconds, okay? And usually when we're working with delays, we'll work in milliseconds because we're working on very short time frame, okay? But if I take this and delay it a little bit, and I, I, I will critique this by saying that I wish this was not in 50 millisecond increments, but I can delay one and delay the other. Everybody hear that now? So now you're getting kind of a uh, a flam, if you will, uh, is the kind of percussion term, right? Like that. Okay. They're starting a little bit later. Okay. So this is a, this is one technique you can do is to actually delay the MIDI information so that the starts of notes are not precisely at the same time. Okay. And it gives you just a little bit of variation in your overall timbral mix. Yeah, Marcus. Yeah, different start point, okay. 
it, it doesn't necessarily matter. It um, it's going to be dependent on what timbre, what instruments you're using, and what combinations you're using. Okay, okay. So this is kind of a salt to taste kind of area, right? Okay, you can mix this up, but you can get some different uh, effects, some more intricate, some uh, some more complexity in your timbre by messing around with these these types of things. Actually, delaying the start of this. If you don't have this plugin available to you, which I realize you all don't, you can do this manually. But uh, if I go into the clip and I simply select all and start to nudge it. Okay, it's going to go in chunks of 16th notes, which is not necessarily the best thing to do, but if I click and drag, I should be able to get inside. Everybody see that? So what I'm doing now is I'm manually adjusting the start time. The reason I like the plugin is that it doesn't, it keeps everything locked into the tempo, so you know where it's like supposed to be, and then the amount that you're delaying it, basically. But you can do this manually by simply grabbing the notes and just kind of shifting them over, okay? Uh, I don't see another way to do that in the clip editor, no? Yeah. Logic actually has a, a, a separate uh, dial for it on the specific uh, MIDI clip. You can actually dial in a little bit of delay on the start of the MIDI notes, uh, and I don't see that here in live. It may be there, but I'm just not familiar with where it is. Daniel. Oh, you mean, uh, oh, the timing? Uh, I, honestly, I don't know. I haven't seen that yet. It may be there, like I said, but that's, again, some levels of uh, control that, that might be different between Logic and Live, okay? Yeah. Not that I, I, I know of. Like I said, I, I'm not familiar with where it might be. Uh, okay, so enough about delaying. So that's one form of delay, to actually delay the instruction so that it starts uh, a little bit later, okay? So we've got our lovely uh, bass uh, repeating working. Uh, I've got some other layers here for you to add in that you can uh, build out your Pocket Bells Canon. So let's go ahead and fire up this. Oh, lovely. Okay. I'll start with uh, is that lovely? Okay. Okay. So one of the things we can do with a kind of ground bass is add in layers and kind of in a pyramid style start to build up our our composition our music uh, production here basically this kind of pyramid construction where tracks uh, or instruments add in one by one each time the cyclic pattern comes back around okay is very common in popular music okay this kind of pyramid construction and then it will sometimes the reverse will happen on the on the on the end of a song right Layers will come out one by one, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do uh, now, I'm going to actually use the record feature to actually build this up, build up my arrangement, okay? So if, if you don't remember how to do this, right, we've been spending all this time in the session view, right? But I want to demonstrate how we can um, use the session view. Let's see, I want to I want to get in here and I'm going to stop all these clips, okay? So if I use the master, any one of the, the uh, slots that has nothing on it, it will kill all the clips, right? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit record, and it's going to start. Uh, I'm going to start with my ground bass on just one level here, and I've got my sync set to four bars, so I'm starting off with one version of my bass, okay? And because this is a four bar loop, I can safely hit these and know that they're going to jump in at the next go round of the Pocket Bells Cannon, right? Lovely, okay. So we've added these layers on the second go round. Uh, maybe I want to fire this clip. this one in next time. And let's 
let's trigger this one and then this one. Maybe that's where I want to end up, but then I'll uh, pull this out, make that my uh, ending mark, right? And next time through, I'll just go ahead and cut these out. So that I end with one little, and I'll stop after that. I hit stop, okay? Uh, so I've hit stop on my session and I now go to a range view, okay? Uh, again, this is a, what I kind of call this a pyramid construction. It's, it's kind of upside down because the, the tracks are going from uh, low to high, right? Okay, but everybody see the kind of pyramid construction that I've created here, okay? So this is my, um, my overall arrangement that I just created, okay? And I did that by simply hitting record on the session Okay, and when I had record on the session and I was in the session view, all that clip firing logic recorded it, okay? Uh, and it created this overall arrangement for me, okay? Uh, now, to connect this with the, the, the chapter, right? Okay, we've recorded this arrangement. Uh, we can now add locators to this arrangement, okay? And this was in the chapter on page 90, okay? If you need to go back and refresh your memory about this. Uh, but if I click in this area, okay, I'll, I'll trigger it, let's see. I think I have to, what is it, control click? Yeah. So let me zoom in a little bit here. If you created your own arrangement, you can try this out or you can just switch over to arrangement view and, and work on this. If I control click, I can add a locator at specific points, okay? And by default, they're just gonna number themselves, but I'm gonna go ahead and call this my intro, right? Okay. I'm going to now zoom out, and let's see, I said this was kind of where I want to end up, right? Uh, oh, they're not playing right now. Um, are they muted, something like that? If I zoom in here, I'm going to go ahead and create a locator at this point, and I'm going to call this my, my vamp, right? Okay, this is where I, I'm, I'm okay with repeating this over and over again, okay? And if I zoom out, this is my, uh, let's see... Uh, let's click on this point and I'm going to zoom in here and I'm going to control click I add another locator and this is my outro okay so I'm labeling sections of my work okay um, you can right these are this is like the markers in Pro Tools this is like the markers are, are they called markers in Logic who remembers I can't remember if they're called markers or not I know they are in Pro Tools I'm trying to remember the name in Logic right Okay, markers, yeah. Um, okay, but unlike Logic and Pro Tools, we can actually map keys to these locators. Okay, this is where the live functionality starts to overlap with the arrangement functionality, okay? So if you remember, how do we, how do we map keys? Where do we start? Yeah, press the key button, okay? And the process is very similar if we press the MIDI button, right? But if I hit key at this point, You'll notice that the intro, vamp, and outro are highlighted in orange. That means I can map keys to them, right? So if I click on this one and then I click the I key, okay, the key I is now set up for my intro. If I click key again and then click vamp and then click V, okay, that's now my vamp so I can jump to that location if I want to, okay? And then if I click on the last one and I click O, okay, so now if I look at my key map for this session, for this live set, I is going to go to the intro, O is going to uh, go to the outro, V is going to go to my vamping section, okay. So I now have keystrokes that I can use to jump to specific sections of my song, right. How, why would this be useful in a live performance situation? Uh huh. Yeah, okay. 
play something more than once or, or, or cue up different sections of the song. Now, we've only got three sections here, right? Intro, vamp, and outro, right? But could you see how if you had a multi-section song with different uh, places that you wanted to kind of hit in different moments of your performance, right? Uh, you can cue this up so that you can uh, hit certain arrangement points uh, and interactively switch between them. Victoria, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're in this one and you're triggering part two songs, then you want to trigger a section like that. If you did B, does it work in conjunction with that, or is it need a whole situation to kind of change and interact with sections? Um, it's kind of, well, let me think how to answer your question. Uh, it's, I, think, it, I think it works both and, that you, you're triggering specific sections. Obviously, you don't want to map the same key to different th clips in your clip view, basically. Um, but you can get to that arrangement section and then still be orchestrating the clips, basically. Okay. Uh, now, I called this section vamp, but there's nothing in it currently that tells Logic to loop that section of our, of our composition, right? Uh, that's where the little loop indicator comes into play, okay? So this thing that we were using on the clip to expand it to be actually four bars long, there's a loop indicator for the overall session, and if I slide that over to these four bars, okay, that's now my looping section of my composition, okay? Now that is truly a vamp, right? Vamp is a right term comes uses in, in jazz band, right? Okay, what's a, I mean, yeah, it's a section that you repeat over and over, right? Okay, ad nauseum. Okay, uh, and if I now, uh, let me see, I'm going to get out of key view here. I've now told it where to loop. If I now come in here and I turn on my loop, okay, it's not going to loop right away by default, but when it gets to that section of the composition, it's now going to loop those four bars over and over again. Everybody see where I'm going with this? I now have an interactive composition that I can trigger the intro. It's going to get to those four bars, loop over and over again until I tell it to stop, or until I hit the O and trigger the outro. Make sense? Okay, so now if I zoom back out, okay, and let's see if I hit my I key, okay, I'm now at the intro and I hit play. Uh, why am I not hearing anything? Let me go back to this. Oh, hey, it's not playing my. Okay, if it's in my arrangement, why would it not? If I can get it to play this. This was working last night, I promise you. <laughs> what else? Oh, this, yeah, that's that's what plays the set. Okay, yes, correct, thank you. And of course it disappeared, now I can't get back to it. Now it's playing the arrangement. Okay, but if I decide, I'll, I'm going to jump to the vamp. If I hit V, just like clip firing, it waits. No, of course not. Why would it do that? Okay, why are my key firing not working? I click it. Oh, I'm going to click it manually. Should get to this uh, section now and start looping. Lovely, okay. Let's see if it repeats. Come on, live. Work. Yep, yeah. okay. And it's going to loop those far bars until I tell it to go to the outro, uh, which my keystroke's not working right now, but if I click on this, you'll see it. No? Okay. Maybe I need to turn off the looping and then click outro. There it goes. Okay. So something's not up. Something is uh, off a little bit here in my, my setup, but I'd have to investigate a little bit more. But you get the idea, yes? 
of being able to build a kind of interactive segments of your composition and be able to trigger them and cue them up. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay, so that's the arrangement stuff I wanted to cover, uh, and that's stuff that I was pulling out of the uh, the the uh, the chapter, right? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't work completely to a T. I'm going to go ahead and go back to my looping section here because uh, we need to start adding in delays, right? Okay, more delays. Uh, and so you can hear what it does. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play here. No. Let me stop this. Let me go back to session. Uh, where I have the delay set up is on this chiffy sinusoidal lead here. Okay. Um, so rather than play our arrangement again, let's just, uh, I'm going to play the B-flat constant. Oh, it's, I'm going to turn off the arrangement. I'm going to solo this. Okay. So I picked out the clip that has one note. Okay, so I can play for you guys what this does. Okay. And I've got on your session a filter delay already set up okay so you should see it there everything's turned off you should notice that yes okay so what does this filter delay do what the delay does is it allows us to feed a little bit of the audio in and just like it, the name says delay it okay why would we want to do that well we can create a, a whole host of effects by adding in delays okay so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on and by default, the way I've set it up, after you turn it on, you, you're not going to hear the delay, okay? The first thing you have to do is, I'm going to zoom in here so you, whoa, not that far. Back up, okay? Everybody hear the, my B flat, okay? If I take, take this middle layer, okay? So this is three layers to my delay. If I take this middle one and I start to turn up the volume, everybody hear how that's affecting the sound? Turn it back down so you, that's the dry signal. Turn up the delay. Now the delay is set to one millisecond, okay? That's a very short delay. In fact, that's a delay where your brain actually can't hear the delayed copy of the sound, okay? Your, your brain actually needs a little bit of time between the first arriving sound and the second arriving sound in order for you to hear them as two discrete signals, okay? We'll talk about it a little bit more on uh, Wednesday, but it's what's called the precedence effect, okay? It's a psychoacoustic phenomenon where your brain locks into the first arriving signal, okay? You're going to hear it more as a filtering effect in that, one, uh, that zero to two millisecond range, okay? But if I take this time and I start to increase it, you can kind of hear a little bit of a doubling there. And once I get beyond 50 milliseconds, that's where your brain starts to actually hear it as a second copy of the sound. Everybody hear that? Okay. So that's volume. I'm turning up one delayed copy of the sound, okay? The next step would be then to turn up the feedback, okay? And if I turn up the feedback, what happens then is the delay starts to feed back on itself, okay, and you get multiple copies. So not only do you get a copy at 79 millisecond, but then 2 times 79, and then 3 times 79, and then 4 times 79. So if I turn up the feedback, we hear that tail coming in now. And if I turn it up again, the, the actual time. Okay. What am I doing on time? I'm getting toward the end of my time here, but so uh Okay. This is a filter delay, okay, which means a couple of things. It's not just a, a a delay, but there's actually a filter we can add into the feedback circuit. So all of the delayed copies get also additionally processed by the filter, okay? So if you now take this and turn on the filter, that's what this on switch does right here. I can go up. Hear 
the ringing quality to it, okay? That's because there's a filter in the feedback circuit. So every time the copy goes back through the system, it's getting filtered more and more, okay? So, um, <clears throat> and hopefully I can break this down a little bit more clearly inside of Max, but digital delay, so a digital delay by itself is almost too perfect a copy of the sound, okay? Uh, and it ends up having this kind of sterile quality to it. So usually, in order to simulate more of what, uh, what you'd find in an analog delay circuit, a filter gets added into the mix, gets added into that feedback circuit so that you get it kind of modulating, changing as it's building up these copies, okay? So that's the purpose of the delay, is to give it just a little bit of a different timbral quality to the delayed copies of your signal, okay? Uh, if I then take this, let's see, uh, maybe I'll uh, switch up to something that's actually uh, changing pitch, so you can hear the So right now I'm using one delay, I'm controlling the time, I've got the, the initial volume set to negative 4 dB and then it, it's going to be going through a feedback circuit that's dampening it by 71% every time, okay? Now all of these delays in live actually have two modes, one where you control the raw time, the, the actual uh, absolute time. If I click this time button here though, it switches to sync mode. And when I'm in sync mode, it actually uses subdivisions of the beat. This is why I, I like keeping the tempo, make sure you've got your tempo set to where you actually need it, okay? If I change this now, I can be on the quarter note. Here are my delayed copies all sync up. Okay. Fifth is, as you would expect, a fifth of a, uh, of a beat. Sixth is like a double triplet. Uh, eighth is going to be like eight, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, okay? So you can get some interesting rhythmic effects by selecting different subdivisions of the beat. Okay? And in this filter delay, you have not just one of these, you actually have three of them. So we've been playing with one. If you then now turn on the one that's panned to the left, turn up its feedback, and turn on its filter, you can get some really complex effects out of this thing. Right here what this is doing? Okay. But this is that delay. Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna break down the delay a little bit more on Wednesday. Okay, uh, make sure you work through the Max tutorials on delays, so we, uh, you have the kind of basic objects in your head in terms of what you can do with these. But hopefully, this lets you hear a little bit of what it can do uh, and where we can go with this. Okay, any questions? No. So. I, honestly, I need to invest. I'm sure there's got to be a way to do it. I just, I need to, yeah. Yeah. You might be able to do that with some, uh, there's some interesting things you can do with um, what's called clip following. You can actually define what happens after a clip is played. And that actually, I was messing around with that last night. I have a feeling that that might have been why my thing was screwed up because I was using the clip follow function. I, don't, I didn't want to introduce that because it's just one more thing today, okay? Uh, make sure you read about delays in Max. Get started on project one if you haven't gotten that message yet, okay? Uh, I'll be here to, I can answer some questions uh, afterwards, but if you need to go, go ahead and go. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later.